when SEALs talk about Jocko, as far as especially in my era, you know, things that, you know, just like if somebody brings up, hey, do you see Jocko this or Jocko that? And the first thing they'll say, what a fucking tool. What a murderous soul. What a, what a fucking turd. What a clown show. What a loudmouth. And then, you know, always, what, what a bully. So now he's on, you know, all of her podcasts. First thing, Jocko, you know, failed as a SEAL leader on the battlefield. I mean, he made the situation worse. He made us, he made more enemies, uh, and he got good Marines, good SEALs killed, you know, in this action. You know, Tim Samantha got reprimanded. He, he tried to stage a fight between, you know, you know, Delta and Six. So they, they went off the reservation. They were basically, there was multiple stories where um, it's called the Four Corner, um, uh, well known within the SEAL community, that Chris Kyle, you know, was basically, it was on top of a, you know, a mount, on top of a house, and he starts shooting. The other gunners that were look, watching all the other Four Corners, you know, because they were out there by themselves, just like, okay, let me get over there and get some, because, you know, you need, you're a sniper, you need to kind of focus on, and soon as, you know, Chris Kyle moves to the other corner, he starts shooting over there. The guy that basically relieved them at that corner where he was shooting couldn't find any uh, legitimate targets. He just left the corner where Chris Kyle just went to. Chris Kyle starts shooting over there. And so another, just like, well, let me go there and see what, you know, what Chris, no, and Chris moved to all four corners, taking shots and shooting innocent people. And there was no legitimate, you know, targets. What's going on, folks? Welcome back to Beyond the Beret. Uh, today, I have Eric on the show. If you guys don't know who he is, um, he is a former Navy SEAL. Uh, he was recently on the Anti-Hero podcast. Um, he did a, a segment with Brent Tucker, a uh, guy that I've had on the show before. If you guys haven't watched that one, make sure you go check it out. Um, in that podcast, Eric speaks about Marcus Luttrell, and then I also reacted to that video, providing my two cents, right? Um, Eric, again, man, I appreciate you coming on. I can't uh, thank you enough for doing what you're doing uh, for your community. Uh, with that said, Eric, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and let the people know exactly who you are, and then we'll go from there. Hey, Jay, thanks for having me on, and uh, it's such an important you know topic to be talking about and try to shed light on. Uh, what's going on? My background is that uh, I was in the Navy for a little over 27 years. Seven of it was regular Navy, then uh, 20 of it was in the SEAL teams. Um, and during that time, you know, we went from uh, not being at war into being in war. So I, I was watched the transition and how things evolved and uh, and the things that started happening uh, as we progressed in war and how some guys were basically doing things that weren't um that put other guys' lives in danger or got them killed because they were trying to make a name for themselves. And I'm just going to expose, you know, another side of this story uh, to what, you know, kind of happened on the ground there. So the American public who's been deceived and lied to and these gold star families that have been deceived and lied to uh, know, you know, what actually happened on the ground there. And, and my hope to doing this is basically to expose this so it doesn't happen again for one, and that the ones that are monetarily capitalizing off the blood of my brothers uh, are basically are called out and known so that they don't make any more money off the blood of my brothers. So with that, I know there's been a lot of guys that's reached out to me and uh, sent to my podcast and given me more information. And, you know, the task force bruiser uh, has been one that keeps popping up that guys, you know, feel uh, seals feel like, hey, that story needs to get out, Eric. And and right now, I'm I'm kind of the spokesperson for him. I think you know a lot of these guys that are providing me this information will come forward themselves, you know, a, in the future. But I can kind of speak for them through some of the stuff. So with that, if you um, want to lead, you know, here's a letter from a Marine that was there on the ground, and we can kind of see from his perspective what Task Force Bruiser did for him. Jay, if you don't mind reading that letter, because I got other stuff I'm going to read later on. So before we get to the letter, Eric, I just want to hit this uh, real quick, because 
I want people to understand exactly um, why we're doing this, right? Because I don't want people uh, thinking that we're doing this because we're we're bashing seals or we're doing this because of jealousy or anything of that sort, right? Because at the end of the day, um, when it comes to the special operations community, I'm part of that community too. And uh, I'm glad that I have you on here, a former SEAL, for 27 years from that community to help speak uh, to this, right? Uh, so if you don't mind, Eric, please share uh, with me, like, have you tried attacking this issue from like the Navy SEAL ranks? Because correct me if I'm wrong, you've been pretty vocal about corruptions throughout your entire career. So, so why social media and why not keep attacking it from the inner circle? Yeah, no, great point. Uh, so while I was active duty, you know, I started seeing this corruption and uh, guys that were basically, you know, within our, my community, we called it scraping the gold off the trident, basically using the trident, you know, attached to their or seal attached to their name to try to make something or tried to. And there was guys like, you know, Tim Szymanski, who was steering contracts to um, other you know, organizations or other people uh, that uh, weren't, you know, basically in the SEAL's best interest. It was for him to be able to make money or, or you know, uh, or steer contracts to somebody else that could make money. And so I filed an IG complaint when I started seeing this corruption and uh, internally said, hey, these guys are doing these different things and it needs to be investigated. And uh, that it went up the chain like, a, you know, an internal investigation is supposed to. It's supposed to go outside your chain of command because I was fighting it within my chain of command and got no results. And I was getting um, it was getting squashed. And I knew it was, you know, not only ethically, but it was, you know, criminally, you know, not right. And so that investigation kind of went up and it went right back to NSW and nothing happened. And many of my other, you know, uh, teammates did the exact same thing. And um, so the, you know, I filed my IG complaint and, you know, nothing really happened from that point on. And then I was continually fighting it while I was in until, all the way up until I retired. So it was as I slowly started seeing the SEAL teams deteriorate, to, you know, that's when all the books started coming out. The guys were doing, you know, on, you know, not being the quiet professionals. And it was always the guys that were always doing it were the ones before they were always in trouble for something. You know, Tim Samantha, you got reprimanded. He, he tried to stage a fight between, you know, you know, Delta and six. And when they both units don't even or, or not even, you know, exist. And so as far as out here, so him and another SEAL tried to basically promote a fight. So he got in trouble for it. Both commands shot, you know, shot that you know, when he was trying to push this thing, shot it down. He got a, a letter of reprimand in his, you know, in his record saying, you're an idiot. Don't do stupid things like that. But he was real, you know, it was, it was a small slap on the wrist, but it kind of showed, you know, his intent. And that was before 9-11. Then after 9-11 happened, you know, so everybody's, you know, these poor performers, you know, to realize that, you know, Tim Smatsky is a poor performer and there's lots of other team guys that, that he surrounds himself that are also all poor performers. All the top notch guys were going to war and doing great things and, you know, do, making a, a reputation that the SEALs would be proud of. Well, Tim Szymanski, you know, basically, you know, takes these guys that were kind of the bottom of the barrel, surrounds himself with them, gets them promoted. Well, because he's an officer and gets these guys the right fit, you know, evals and fit reps and gets them promoted when a lot of, <laughs> A lot of these guys were not only kicked out of the team, but, you know, some of them had like three DUIs, um, you know, issues with drugs, you know, as far as it was just, it was surprising to everybody around that, you know, of all the people that you can pick to surround yourself with, you know, as far as that Tim Szymanski was picking these guys. And so these guys, um, as they progressed up the chain, and I'm talking about Scotty Keltner, um, was the other guys out um, Cooper, Dave Cooper, uh, all these guys um, had problems throughout their whole career. Now that they got advanced and they got into leadership positions, just like Tim Szymanski did, he now was getting to where he was putting you know, put in uh, charge of operations. So that's when Roberts Ridge happens. Roberts Ridge, if 
you know, your viewers don't know. That's when we, you know, Tim Szymanski says, tell Slab, Brett Slabs, not Slab, everybody's nickname, I know a butcher's name. Uh, and the, the nickname now is Roberts Ridge. Slab tries to get it pushed 24 hours because he, he doesn't want to land right on top of it. He wants to do somewhat of an offset. Since you're doing a recce, you never land on the X. And this is just, this is standard protocol. This is SOPs. Everybody knows if you're doing a recce, you need to basically, you know, be a mile or two off, have a huge uh, terrain feature in between you. You never land on the X where you want to basically set up an observation location because you don't want anybody to know you're there. You're a small unit. Slab tries to bump it 24 so that he, because they got behind it, uh, the schedule of being there. And um, Tim Szymanski says, nope, you know, go do it now. So they tried to land on top of the uh, mountain. As soon as they start to set down, they see that it's uh, got people up there. The uh, helo pilot sees there's donkey and it's like, wait. Then all of a sudden they get started getting shot up you know, as they're coming in for that approach because they were heavily fortified, which everybody else knew. And I don't know how Tim Szymanski didn't know this. Um, so they start to land and that's when Neil Roberts falls out of the back of the helicopter. And that's when um, uh, the helicopter has to veer off and it basically does a controlled crash landing further off. Another helicopter that was, you know, comes in, picks up, you know, Brent and his guys and a guy named, you know, as far as, I'll use some nicknames because it doesn't matter. Turbo and um, uh, and oh, um, John Chapman, who was the uh, combat uh, CCT guy, who was basically close air support Air Force um, guy for us. They they're going back up to the top of the mountain, land the exact same spot where the other helicopter just got shot up. They jump off the helicopter, and that's when. Um, there's a pred feed on this on YouTube that you can watch and it's, it's clearly uh, narrated. Long story short, Chapman is a fucking hero. He goes up there and takes a machine gun bunker by himself. The, uh, the seals start getting shot up. Uh, Slab says that he thought he checked for Chapman, thought Chapman was dead. The seals escaped down the side of the mountain and then they just start dropping bombs on top of the mountain. That was a story that was sold to the SEAL teams for a long period of time that we all thought was that's what the truth was, that they you just hit overwhelming force and it wasn't a tactical friggin nightmare. Well, 10 years later, when the Pred feed uh, um, uh, comes out and they're able and they're trying to work to get John Chapman his a, a upgrade on his medal because the Air Force had no. Congressional Medal of Honors from Afghanistan. They're just like, hey, do we have any guys that's worn, you know, such a, an award? And the only one that was coming close was Chapman. So they started really investigating what actually happened there. And they were able to use their embitters to figure out who was who, you know, the black little dots when they're looking at the uh, the drone footage, the pred feed, which looked like little black dot, dots running around on, you know, on top of the mountain. They were able to triangulate who was who on the mountain. And then they looked at the statements from what um, Slab and the guys had stated before and um, and basically uh, what they did, you know, as far as to figure out who was who on the mountain. That's when, you know, Slab said he checked for Chapman, but he never even got close to where Chapman was at. Never really checked to see if he was dead. Well, Chapman was still alive and uh, they escaped down the mountain. And that's when the pred feed was able to do all this. And now, you know, as far as that's information that's really clearly defined out there, but that's how, you know, the operations went south and, the, you know, the bigger cover-ups started to happen. And since Tim Szymanski had a lot of um, success in covering it up, now all of a sudden it's starting to get exposed by the Air Force. And the only reason that we know the truth is because the Air Force basically investigated and, and, and found out that Tim Szymanski and Brett, they were all lying and that it didn't make any sense of the story. So now, so now you got to understand that's the character of Tim Szymanski and the guys that were up there. So that just kind of sets the stage of these, you know, bad actors that were, you know, problems all through their career. And then they were able to stay in and not be held accountable for those, you know, smaller actions and which led to, multiple guys dying you know the number of guys that were injured on uh roberts ridge i think 19 injured and seven or eight died don't quote me on the 
I know those, but uh, it, it was uh, you know a time period ago, and they all happened because of you know a couple of guys doing the wrong thing. So then we can get into you know basically you know um, you know task force bruiser, and uh, so before we get into task force bruiser, you need to you know before somebody makes a hero out of somebody. Um, and, and puts them on such a pedestal. And, you know, and just because you got Navy SEAL attached to your name, they get a, a lot of street credit slash a lot of um, uh, expected um, integrity. And uh, so it, it's going to be hard for some of these people to understand that, hey, within my community, there are some SEALs who have been deceiving and lying to the American public about what they did, and worse, they've lied to the Gold Star families, and and made um, changed the narrative of how their son died um, to make it look like that they were that the leaders didn't do anything wrong. Their sons did die as heroes. I mean, you know, as far as they were out there doing, living by the um, the you know the SEAL code. Um, so. It's 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 a problem that America needs to know about because if they don't understand it and they can't recognize it, then um, they'll fall victim to it, and and that's why these guys are having so much success on the media and on the you know as far as the social media and everything else, and why they're able to monetarily capitalize off the blood of guys that they shouldn't even. Uh, had into those situations with all that said eric let's uh jump right into this letter that was sent to us by the marine xo and then we'll go from there all right i'm gonna read this letter guys and i'm also gonna put it in the description box below so you guys can read it yourself all right let's jump right into it as the company executive officer for india company third battalion marines i deployed as an advanced party to ramadi in january 2006 our company was stationed at camp blue diamond and our battalion command operations center was Hurricane Point. We established observation points including Horea, Hawk and others. The Battle of Ramadi was underway. We established good working relationships with local civilian leadership figures, sheikhs, in the first part of our deployment. We worked to gain their trust and cooperation and had regular meetings. In the middle of our deployment we were told that U.S. Special Operations Forces were operating in our area. We cooperated with Delta and operated with them, they showed complete professionalism and we worked together on securing the Ramadi Hospital. There was another group of SOF in our area, they were SEALs from Task Unit Bruiser. They were extremely unprofessional and consistently broke rules of engagement, standard operating procedures not announcing their presence arriving and departing our area of operation posing great risk of fratricide and friendly fire scenarios. I talked to Task Unit Bruiser's lieutenant directly about it and was completely disrespected and ignored. Kilo Company held ground near the government center. It was an active area and they had observation posts set up to beef up security. The Kilo Company XO warned myself, and other leaders at our command operations center that Kilo Company had been in the neighborhood east of the government center and witnessed the SEALs kill an elderly man doing yard work, raking rocks, and upon searching the scene and finding him unarmed, the SEALs rolled his body up in a rug and threw it over the wall around his property. We were informed of this as a warning and told to be ready for the local retaliation. We knew this would have repercussions. Immediately following this we lost a Marine in 3rd Platoon who was shot in the head on what was supposed to be a normal patrol at the time. Direct and indirect fire saw a surge, and the intel reporting on our wounded and killed in action confirmed this. The local sheiks immediately refused to meet with us and told us that more retaliations for the killing of an innocent were coming. All of our crucial relationships we had developed with the local Iraqi civilians in our area were destroyed, and given the enemy that we were fighting, developing relationships was a mission critical task. We saw an immediate increase in improvised explosive devices and had to change tactics, logistics, and all movements. We could no longer foot patrol our area while the SEALs were in our area of operation. It became too dangerous. We could only establish and monitor observations points for ambush and bomb setups. Our translators continued to seek information from the locals and tried to get leadership to meet with us. They confirmed that this was a response, retaliation to the killing of an innocent elderly man. All of our company leadership compared intel and tried to put the pieces together for a solution. We all knew of Task Unit Bruiser, with their signature Punisher skull patches, was causing mayhem in the area. They were gut-shooting women from their firing position of the hospital, 
killing unarmed Iraqis, and not cooperating with U.S. forces on the ground to de-conflict the battle space. It was obvious that they were not only directed to act in the manner which they did, but were also protected by their leadership, because the combined leadership of 3 to 8 and other local units were reporting bruisers' wild and wanton acts of violence to their own chain of command, as they were resulting in Marines getting killed in retribution attacks. But our reports fell on deaf ears. We lost 36 Marines. The vast majority of those losses were only in the middle months of deployment when Task Unit Bruiser was present. Years later, after trying desperately to put all this behind me I was asked if I knew who any of those individuals were, I was shown a picture of them. Little did I know that this group that had created so much havoc had become famous. I pointed out their lieutenant immediately as the one, that I had talked to in order to rectify this problem, and he would not cooperate, I had words with trying to get cooperation from them. That person was Leif Babin. I had deployed previously in 2004 for Tahiti, and 2005 to Iraq, and worked with SEALs previously. They were outstanding. The unprofessionalism displayed and violations of rows I saw from Task Unit Bruiser was startling and extremely concerning especially given the deadly cost to U.S. forces. So, uh, with all that said, Eric, what are your thoughts and if you want to get right into what you and I are here to discuss, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so there was another task unit there before task unit um, uh, Bruiser gets there, who had had great success, and that's why the Marines were um, they were they were able to patrol their AOs because we were going out after guys that uh, that mattered as far as and we would uh, it wasn't just it was capture it was kill capture you know and we were capturing guys that led to bigger targets. And so we, those guys were making that AO, AO a lot safer, and they had great success. Then Jocko comes in, and he sees that you know the uh, the bar was set pretty high, and uh, those guys uh, had so much success that he thought that the only way that he could beat their record is getting more kills. And so it became a body count. So you know, first thing Jocko, you know, failed as a SEAL leader on the battlefield. I mean, he made the situation worse. He made us, he made more enemies uh, and he got good Marines, good SEALs killed, you know, in this action. So that's why, you know, the American public needs to know that they've been deceived by this guy who has no empathy for human life whatsoever. And as I moved down, you know, kind of going through, it starts, so when, when SEALs talk about Jocko, as far as, especially in my era, you know, things that, you know, just like if somebody brings up, hey, do you see Jocko this or Jocko that? And then the first thing they'll say, what a fucking tool. What a murderous soul. What if, what a fucking turd. What a clown show. What a loud mouth. And then, you know, always what, what a bully. So now he's on, you know, all over podcasts, basically saying what a war hero and what his guys did and uh, how hard their deployment was. And what all he did was basically let his guys loose. And, you know, Chris Kyle, who was, you know, you know, basically who was trying to brand himself as to beat Halfcock's, you know, record, he let him go. And, and it ended up with all these things uh, happening. So l let's look at like, um, you know, Mark Lee. Mark Lee died, you know, in the... Um, you know, early in the deployment, somewhat early in the deployment. And uh, shortly before his death, you know, he writes a letter to his mom. And I can kind of, you know, and I think it's well out there. I got a copy of it. But some of the uh, things that he says in the letter to his mom is that I've seen things here that are unjustified and uncalled for. Uh, I've seen the morals of a man who cares nothing for human life. Now, is he talking about Chris Kyle or is he talking about Jocko as far as that's you know, in this letter to his mom? Because he's a little bit cryptic and he doesn't, you know, call it out. He's tried to doesn't probably doesn't want to, you know, um, concern his mom too much or make her, you know, worry too much. So and then shortly after that, you know, he ends up dead. So he was standing up, you know, no doubt he was standing up to these guys and say, this is stupid. You're and just like the Marine said, he saw, you know, Mark Lee probably see him killing innocent people, you know, and Chris Kyle, you know, it's well documented that, you know, he's done some stupid, crazy stuff. And I'll get into that here in a little bit, but Mark Lee's death needs to be reinvestigated. 
And, you know, there's people that know the real story on what happened there. And his mom is not getting the real story. Then, then comes Michael Monsoor, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, went out and saved another SEAL that got shot up in, uh, out in the street. He lived and died by the SEAL code. This guy knew who had, you know, family members and sent, you know, and what I'll do is, you know, before even this, these deaths happen, um, there was a, there was a, a SEAL Team 6 senior operator that goes to Jocko, who has, you know, intel of the area, what's going on. He tells Jocko, he goes, Hey, these day, you know, first thing Jocko was sending him out on daylight patrols and daylight, you know, raids and, you know, out. And, it, you know, it, it's not that going out in the daylight, you know, we, we don't do or we can't do. It's just that it's better for us tactically to go out during the night with an objective of somebody who matters, not just going out to patrol the contact. So when we heard these guys were down there, you know, in Ramadi doing, you know, daylight patrols and daylight raids, we were just like, what the fuck is going on? It didn't make any sense to us. And then, you know, the first death happens. Then, you know, um, then Mikey Bonsoir, you know, gets killed. And to come to find out that Jocko was warned before those deaths, and he said, said that, the, you know, this senior SEAL operator from Dev Group went to him and said, hey, they know who you are now. You've been going out so much and you've been creating so much havoc and you've, you've, you know, you've made more enemies than you've, uh, than you've taken off and you're killing innocent people that they're setting up on you. They know who you are now. And every time you guys leave, they're trying to figure out how to get you. And that's when these guys end up dying. And what Mark or what um, Jocko tells this senior you know guy goes, you know, I'm taking it to the enemy. I'll do what I want. Now, did he warn his guys? Probably not. Did he take? Did he go out there with his guys? Very seldom. And so he he put these guys out there in this situation that they know you're coming, they know where you're at, and you're out there in a small number. And he's also made such bad friends with the coalition forces, U.S. forces there that. They were they didn't probably want to support him anyway because they're just getting him, you know, their own guys killed. So they, they went off the reservation. They were basically there's multiple stories where um it's called the four corner um uh well known within the SEAL community that Chris Kyle, you know, was basically was on top of a you know a mountain on top of a house and he starts shooting. The other gunners that were watching all the other four corners, you know, because they were out there by themselves, just like, OK, let me get over there and get some because, you know, you need you're a sniper. You need to kind of focus on. And soon as, you know, Chris Kyle moves to the other corner, he starts shooting over there. The guy that basically relieved them at that corner where he was shooting couldn't find any uh, legitimate targets. He just left the corner where Chris Kyle just went to. Chris Kyle starts shooting over there. So another just like, well, let me go there and see what, you know, what Chris no And Chris moved to all four corners, taking shots and shooting innocent people. And there was no legitimate, you know, targets. It was another uh, time when Chris Kyle bragged about shooting, shooting a guy who was holding a kid. I don't know if it was a little girl or a little guy, but shot through the kid to kill the guy. I mean, this guy is a psychopath and Jocko let him loose and Jocko has no empathy uh, and didn't care about his own guys. So this is what, you know, kind of happened on the ground. And, um, and I don't, I don't think the gold star families know that how Jocko set their sons up pretty much to die. And the only ones that, you know, that, um, that stand up for Jocko or basically back his story is guys that are on his payroll or guys that are basically somehow benefited. And there's a lot of strange deaths around the guys that came back. So it's, you know, that's another thing, another topic, but I need you guys in, you know, that's my fellow Americans out there. You don't need to put this guy up on a pedestal and you need to start asking these questions. And, and, um, so I, I've gone on for a little bit, Jay, you got any questions on what I've covered so far? Oh uh, yes, Eric, I got a quick question. So while he was in country, 
what position was he in? Was he like a a platoon commander or like what was his position during this actual deployment? He was a task uh, task unit commander. So he had uh, two platoons. He should have had two platoons under him at that time. But he, he, I'm not sure if it was two or one. He should have had two platoons under him. Gotcha. And below him then, he had two lieutenants in charge of those two platoons. Yeah, he two. had Leif Babin and uh, Seth uh, Stone, who that's a mysterious death too. And uh, um, so there was, and I think there was another junior officer who was there. Gotcha, gotcha. So at the end of the day then, he was the highest ranking SEAL officer in that AO, right? Um no one else essentially could check him, correct? Yeah, and he didn't fall underneath the uh, Jace, you know, the, the the Team Six guys that were basically warning him and hoping it was getting to his guys. But obviously, his guys, you know, his guys were complaining to him. And I think the only time that Jocko went out is when he got shamed into going out because if you're sending us out there, you need to go out there with us. And I think he did it one time, and and that's another story that's. You know, I I don't have two, um, two source reporting on, but it's something shady happened on that thing too. And once gotcha. I get two source, re which is there's more guys, and that's what you need to realize that you know, you know these guys are lying about everything, but the truth is slowly getting out from these guys, uh, and and I hope this is encouraging to them. And honestly, they need to be safe. The best thing you can do is come out and tell what you know, because then you're not a threat anymore. As soon as you hold something back and you, you're a threat, that's when, you know, like, oh, we need to eliminate that threat before that, you know, it, it becomes a known, you know, thing. So these guys that are holding back information, uh, it's in your best interest to, you know, come forward and, you know, and talk uh, openly about what they saw and what they happened, because it's it's interesting what happened there. Yeah, I got you. I I tell you what, man, I agree 100 percent. And it looks like, you know, based on reading that letter that, you know, all that stuff that they were, it looks like all that stuff that they were doing led to additional Americans uh, getting killed, which is sad within itself. Now, Eric, do you know what his end state was whenever he was in country doing all these things? Was it to just be the most badass, you know, SEAL commander that ever lived? Or like, why was he pushing his guys to do those things? So the only way that Jocko thought that he could beat the numbers or, or, or have more success is if he had a higher body count. And he didn't care if that body count was legitimate. And that's when, you know, Chris Kyle basically says, OK, I've been let loose. To, and, he, and this is a guy that had no empathy um, and is well documented how many times he's, he's lied. And uh, so let's let's talk about, you know, so if you have. um Somebody under your command, as far as which Chris Kyle was underneath Jocko's command. So he's a, a direct representative of, you know, the leadership above him, you know, somewhat. So Chris Kyle, you know, first thing he said, he shot looters at after Hurricane um, uh, Katrina, you know, in, in, uh, when it happened into um, New Orleans. He said that he shot looters that were basically stealing stuff, just like, Fault. And who would claim such a claim that he shot looters, um, you know, that were basically in a desperate situation uh, and, and try to make that seem like it was something to be proud of. Then the next thing was that the command had to intervene multiple occasions because he, you know, was abusive to his wife. And that's well documented. So he's, you know, he has no empathy for, um, you know, for anybody, you know, pretty much. Then he bragged to his teammate about shooting, you know, like I said, shooting the kid, you know, while well, the guy held her, you know, that was a well, everybody heard, a lot of guys heard that story, talked about it to kids and buds. It was just stupid. Then he, you know, he claims that he hit and knocked out Jesse Ventura. And just like Jesse Ventura, one of the, you know, well-recognized SEALs at the time, because this was way before, you know, this is as SEALs start to brand themselves and they're trying to, you know, basically that's when the, the book started, you know, and the movie started. So they're they're trying to compete with Jesse Ventura. So what's the best way to try to make a name for yourself to make a false claim that you hit Jesse Ventura? 
And Jesse Ventura had to go to basically court and defend his name. Like, wait a minute, I wasn't even, in, you know, in country at the time. So Jesse, and he'll join me in this fight. You know, me and you need to talk because, you know, the soul of the SEAL teams are, are at jeopardy now. And it's gotten so corrupt because of guys like Chris Kyle lying, Jocko basically doing the exact same thing. Tim Szymanski basically starting it and starting to show how these same characters who are scraping the gold off the trident, off the blood of my brothers that um, that are doing not being the quiet professionals. They're out there trying to sell a false narrative and they're, you know, basically lying to the American public of who they are and what they've done. And so, you know, the, the American public needs to know this. And, you know, to the great state of Texas, I, I know, you know, I'm hitting some of your, you know, your key guys here lately. And I, and, uh, and I love Texas. It's one of my favorite states. I'm not, you know, bashing your guys. I'm telling you that you've been lied to and manipulated and they used the seal name to do that to you. So don't be uh, upset and offended that it happened. Don't kill me because I'm the messenger. This is the truth. And so every Marine, you know, out there should be fucking furious. They should be up in arms about what Task Force Bruiser did to their guys. They should friggin', you know, call these guys out. And what they saw themselves that were being there. Every SEAL that basically that didn't participate in it, that saw it needs to stand up and basically and say what they saw. And that's the only way we're going to clean up these SEAL teams. And it, we're right now, and I hope Jesse Ventura, you know, jumps on board with me because he, he, you know, I don't have, you know, I got you and Brent so far that I've talked to. And I've talked to the... Um, to other media where it hasn't been, you know, out there, you know, it just hasn't caught, you know, um, traction yet, but it's catching traction now. And that's where we're going. So uh, I hope Jesse, you know, you know, in the process of clearing his name can help me kind of clean up the SEAL team, so, you know, somewhat too. And again, Eric, I appreciate, you know, uh, you doing this. I can't, you know, uh, tell you how much I respect you for doing this, especially when, you know, at this point, uh, during this era, you know, soldiers, Marine and, you know, and, 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 and other people are getting killed because of this, right? At the end of the day, um, truth is truth, you know, right is right. And guys lost their lives because of this. And, uh, the fact that you're, you know, taking upon yourself to do this just speaks value to your character. All right. We'll, uh, uh get ahead of the comment section a little bit, Eric. So what would you tell the folks that are going to watch this? And that are going to paint you as a jealous Navy SEAL that is, you know, essentially uh, talking about someone that that is pretty high within the SEAL organization, right? When you think of Navy SEAL, you think, you know, you know, Jocko, right? So what would you tell the folks that, you know, are going to paint you as a jealous uh, retiree going after somebody that's that's made it on social media financially, right? What would you tell those people? Well, he's, he's selling a false persona that he didn't live up to while he was in the teams. He is capitalized. He is, every time I see Jocko on a podcast, I think, okay, and now that I've, you know, I thought about the blood of my own brothers as far as my SEAL mates that, you know, died, you know, under his command. And I'm just, and then I got this letter from the Marines, how many Marines basically died, uh, as a result of them killing this guy, innocently killing this guy out in the, uh, in the field, raking rock, you know, gardening out there. And I think the American public has been duped and lied to. And Jocko is making lots of money off of these false, you know, claims. And all I think is cha-ching, cha-ching. Every time I see a Jocko on, whether it's on, cable network or uh, a podcast or wherever I see him, I think cha-ching, cha-ching. And that cha-ching, cha-ching is off the blood of my brothers. And it's off the blood of those Marines. It's, it's disgusting. And it's up to us um, to bring a spotlight and expose it 
and let the American public. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, investigate. You know, there's been numerous books out there that the American public where they, a lot of this stuff is noted. And the first one I, I would recommend, and first thing, I don't have a podcast. I don't ever plan on having a podcast. And I and, it, and I and I appreciate you guys that have these noble ones out there. I don't want to be in the media. I don't want to be the face that's basically exposing this. But I'm forced into, I wanted to be that quiet professional that just went off and did great, went fishing my retirement years. But I'm forced into this battlefield um, that is the social media to call out these bad actors. And that's where they, that's where they live and that's where they thrive. And so it's it's uncomfortable for me to be out here doing it. It's going to bring so much heat and unwanted negative attention towards the SEAL community, which I love and which I'm trying to stand up for and which I'm trying to defend. Because guys like Tim Szymanski and his cronies underneath him and Jocko and Chris Kyle are the ones that are destroying us. And that's why you have all these cry for help. You got, you know, um, what's his name? Um uh, uh, Matt Cole, Matt Cole's book, um, uh, Code Over Country. He didn't. He, he didn't start writing a book about seals. He had seals, you know, come to him and say, "Hey, I've tried to, you know, deal with things up the chain of command and do it correctly. I'm not one of these guys that was, you know, that's in that book. It was all a lot of dev group guys because that's what he's talking about. And they came to him, and it was a cry for help." It's a cry for the get the real story out there to call out these false narratives that, you know, a lot of these what I've talked about today. And then so then you got um, you got Alone at Dawn as far as that's another book that everybody needs to read. And uh, and that's, you know, Chapman's book about how he was left on top of the mountain and how they tried to. How they promoted other metals to the seals, but tried to squash you know, his chap, you know, his Congressional Medal of Honor. And that's another disgusting story. And then you end up with, you know, Alpha. And, you know, there's a lot in that book that, you know, as far as it covers a whole gambit of different things, but it's exposing, you know, the truth of what's happening within the SEAL teams. And it's a cry for help. And, and you know, I don't want to seem like I'm on here crying for help, but the America, you know, public needs to get on, you know, needs to do some research and figure out, um, yeah, that they've been being lied to, which, you know, training, it kind of, it comes into, you know, so these guys that uh, didn't follow the SOPs, didn't follow the ROEs, didn't follow the TTPs and they got guys killed. And here recently, we just had two more SEALs die on a mission that is, is our bread and butter. As far as when it comes to VBSS, vessel, vessel boarding search and seizure, you know, that's what SEALs are known. To, that's that's our AO. That's what we do. Nobody else does. It, it should be. Didn't do it as well as we did in the past. Now it's changed is because, you know, the Coast Guard, you know, they got some good schools and some, you know, and I've had guys, SEALs that have gone through it and, and gave it high praises for, you know, going through it. But these two SEALs that recently died, um, didn't first thing the off they said that they did the VBSS training before they deployed they did not which i don't understand how you make a deployment without hitting that block of training they gun decked which for the public that doesn't understand military terms they 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 forged saying that they had actually done the training the officer forged saying that they had done the training then they get out there, they're tasked to do it. They start to do it. They wanted to abort the mission, but another senior officer, just like Tim, you know, Tim Szymanski did to slab, said, no, you're going to land there. They ordered the SEALs to basically to hit that dial. Well, they weren't trained to do it correctly. They didn't have the proper flotation, you know, and it, not having the proper flotation doing VBSS is kind of like, a, a Marine going to battle without a gun. I mean, when we're in the water, we know in how inherently dangerous it is and, how, and what we're carrying and, uh, and, and how you can be knocked out and, and how things can get, you know, kind of crazy just trying to, you know, get on board a ship. And so if you go in the water, you're going to float. And we do, 
what we call dip tests. It's just a standard operating procedures that every SEAL knows. And if we can't get that inherently dangerous mission um, successfully completed, then we've gone so far away from what SEALs capabilities are. It's, it's, just, it's heartbreaking. And those gold star families, and you know, right now should be demanding some heads to roll. And every, all these other gold star families that had guys die, you know, Mark Lee and, you know, Monsoor, as far as they should be like, holy crap, I did not know this side of the story. And this is, you know, and they need to start talking to every other SEAL and, and find out what the truth is out there. Because I'll tell you what, you know, within my community, all the senior officers, all the senior enlisted, we all know that these stories you know, are false and that good guys died for no reason. Now, just curious, Eric, do you think this is more of a leadership problem within your organization or because at the end of the day, like I, you know, from the outside looking in, you have all these, you know, folks on social media um, doing this and it takes you, you know, a retired Navy SEAL to come out here and to shed light on this. And I'm just curious, like, why aren't the folks that are currently on social media, like, why aren't they shedding light on some of the things that are taking place within um, within your uh, former organization, whether it's the stolen valor aspect of it or shedding light on the lack of leadership, you know, within the organization that led to these two seals dying recently? Like, why do you think they're not talking about that? Yeah, well, so you got to look at the ones that are, you know, out there doing it. And uh, so if you look at all the individual podcasts and the people that are are out there, they're doing something similar, just like Jocko, just like Marcus. They're basically, you know, if they start bashing seals, because, you know, America has a love for us because we and, and we've done some great stuff. And it's just that these ones that are actually in the media, not all of them, but most of them, the ones that have these things are the not the quiet professionals. They're the ones that are are being just like a Jocko or just being like, you know, you know, you know, Marcus um, that are basically making money off the blood of their brothers. And I, I got no issues of SEALs making money. I. I I, that's not that's what not what I'm upset about. If it was a legitimate story and you had you know and you were adding value to you know the American public as far as and, you know and Jocko's a lot of his podcasts they have a great you know he's he's portraying him you know somebody that he's not. When you listen to him, just like yeah, that's exactly you know a guy I want to listen to and follow. But he, he didn't live up to it. It's a false persona. It's it's all fake. And he's never been, you know, that solid operator. All these guys that I, I brought up were weak performers and they should have been pushed out of the teams way early. But, you know, 9-11 happens. You know, guys were off at war doing, you know, that stuff. These guys were being held back because they were idiots most of the time. And it once you know certain guys go multiple different times they say no you got to get a break so they start having to send they have to scrape the bottom of the barrel to send some of these other guys over there and now these bottom of the barrel guys like oh that who are not the quiet professionals who have been problems their whole career within the seal teams now they're like oh i'm going to make a name for myself <laughs> and they think getting guys you know a body count you know is success which it is not you, you know it, you're you got to get the right people off the bot the battlefield. That's you know that makes a difference. You just don't go out there picking gunfights um, that you don't need to get into, and you don't need to make enemies when you have enough of them out there already. Yeah, I agree one hundred percent, Eric. Because um, when you're out there, you know, racking up body counts um, and taking out, you know, got and taking out individuals that that aren't enemy combatants, right? If the local population is is going to want to retaliate and start targeting you specifically. And that's gonna lead to, you know, situations that, you know, didn't have to happen to Americans dying that didn't necessarily have to die. You know, it's 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 a very slippery slope to go down. 
Now, Eric, do you think that the current situation that happened with the two Navy SEALs that recently died during the VBSS um, uh, 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 incident, do you think that has anything to do with social media uh, as far as the the narrative that is out there with the books and the movies and the brand? Do you think that has anything to do with the latest incident? Well, they weren't able to control the narrative on this one. Uh, it, well, they did for a little while. And that's just something else as far as a lot of these truths never came out as far as a lot of it's been investigated and looked at, but it got squashed for whatever reason. And so it took invest, you know, with, uh, when I say internal investigations within Naval Special Warfare, as far as there was good guys trying to clean this stuff up and, and hold these guys accountable that went nowhere. Investigative reporters who came in later and, and investigated, that's when things were forced to be dealt with by, I'm going to say the big Navy and NSW. They finally had to start doing something. This one here, and it was funny because I got that question on you know on the anti-hero podcast. I just like, hey, what about you know this VBSS thing? And I said, I don't know what's you know that story. I just know there's something inherently wrong with it, and there's something. So if you look at that podcast, I said there's something not right about that story. Well, here recently, I think only a couple of days ago, an article came out and ex and everything I, that I stated to you that they gun decked the um, the uh, their certification that saying that they had done it. They tried to abort the mission, but the SEAL commander, you know, pushed them to do it anyway. They didn't have the proper flotation. They didn't follow the proper SOPs and TTPs. All these things that we have that have happened time and time again are happening again and it just like just like with red wings as far as extortion so when i you know when i brought up like scotty keltner and um and dave cooper who were tim samansky's cronies who had problems multiple duis drug issues whatever uh those guys basically uh, are big players in extortion 17. so these turds in our community that Tim Szymanski and, and other leaders allowed to promote and push up the, you know, as leaders are the ones that are destroying our team and in the public, you know, and I hope every, you know, there's a target rich, rich environment for investigative reporters um, to look at the SEAL teams. And once, you know, the, the quickest way to get a, rid of a bunch of cockroaches and, you know, and viruses is that shed light on it. And we need to shed, you know, we need a, uh, we need a huge spotlight on the SEAL teams to clean it up. And if we don't, then there might not be an, a SEAL team in the future because yeah. it's turning into a bunch of, of, you know, mess ups. And I can only imagine, Eric, how hard it is for you to do what you're doing, right? Because this is your community. And I know how, you know, certain people are going to take this and, and 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 uh, 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 look at it right uh, now. You mentioned extortion seventeen. I've I've heard several different things about that, but I think the the uh, 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 cover up around that situation was um, they said it was shot down with RPG as opposed to what um, actually happened, which is that it was shot down with SA sevens. Is that the 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 same cover up that that you've heard? That's that's what I'm hearing on my side too, and. Um, okay. But honestly, you know, more guys are coming forward with that and uh, and I'll get more information. It might be a podcast or later on. I don't want to say something that's not true. I and I want to make sure everything everything that I say is accurate. So uh, as more guys are, you know, you know and like I said, I, I don't want to be this face. But, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm not afraid of a fight either. And, and if this is the arena they want to fight in and they want to try to steal the soul of the, of the SEAL teams, they're going to have to go through me and many other great seals um, before that happens. That's awesome. That's awesome, Eric. Now, so let's talk to your actual community, Eric. So for the newer seals that are graduating buds, finishing SQT and getting ready to enter into the Navy SEAL community, as someone that's been there, that's done it and that have knowledge of what's going on, what advice would you have for those newer SEALs as they get ready to um, embark on their journeys? So the first thing is, you know, it was another well-documented thing out at BUDS um, that um, 
we had a steroid problem out at Bud's uh, about a year ago. And Kyle Mullins, who, who basically got through Hell Week, and then there was no medical attention around him, ends up dying right shortly after Hell Week. Well, it, during that investigation, it uncovered that there was instructors out there that were pushing um, human growth hormone and steroids, and that Kyle Mullins, you know, supposedly had some steroids, you know, uh, in his vehicle. And they tried to make it look like Kyle Mullins was the only, you know, the problem that was out there. Well, as his mom and Regina stood up and fought for her son and every gold star family out there needs to fight like this lady did. And she got down to the bottom of it. And because the students that loved her son that were going through buds with them told her exactly what was going on. And she exposed that whole thing. And now buds has gotten cleaned up and a little bit better. And they gotten rid of some of these instructors. And, and it, the leadership that was basically over NSW at that time was they're like, they, Bud's is hard enough by itself. Now, if you had instructors that are basically now, are, are, you know, and getting through it, you get through it on your own merit. But if you got an instructor that doesn't want you to graduate, they can make sure you don't graduate. And then you had, you know, and so before Kyle Mullins, you had Lovelace, who drowned was drowned at the pool by another by an instructor, and wasn't really held accountable. And and this instructor barely passed drown proofing himself. And but he was, you know, splashing you know water in his face. And um, and anyway, and this kid ended up drowning. So I why I'm talking about that is that I want anybody that's going into the SEAL teams to understand that you might run into some instructors that uh, aren't there for, you know, aren't there for the right purpose. And our instructor cadre should be the best of the best. They should be basically the example. Um, and cause they can sit there and mentor these kids getting through and buds for a long period of time, especially during war was a time that, okay, you weren't performing well enough for us to want to take you on deployment. And, we're going to send you there. So not all instructors, but some of the instructors were, you know, weren't the top of the top. And, um, and then there were other ones there that were basically war fighters that done, you know, several deployments and they just needed a break to get things set, you know, for a reset. And those guys are great, but unfortunately there's some other ones out there. So you, as a student, you need to be able to recognize who's who and, um, and, and, you know, and realize that, you know, you're going to run, you might run into, you know, into some problems. Um, gotcha. It's hard for me to rec. It's hard for me to recommend somebody to do it at this point. Um, and it's sad, you know, that I, you know, that I can't, because I'll tell you what, it was one of the best time, you know, it's one of the hardest and uh, best time of my life. I, I, Looking back at Buds, I got such fond memories. Looking back at my time in the teams, all the way up until I ran into Tim Samansky, my career loved it. Loved it. I thought it was just great. Some of the greatest people on this planet are Navy SEALs, and they mentored me, and I'm and I'm proud to you know be one of them. I am I am absolutely proud to be one of them. But until Big Navy, until the American public, you know. Uh, starts calling these bad actors out and my fellow seals that know all this to be true, start doing the exact same thing. Um, it's going to take a little while before it gets cleaned up before I recommend somebody actually going. And that's, it's fucking sad. Now we all know that anything that happens within any organization starts and ends with leaders. So what advice would you have uh, for the leaders that are currently within the seal teams? If you don't start calling out, the leaders that are bad actors that are basically trying to promote themselves and they're not there for the welfare of their teammates. Um, and they're, they're positioning themselves for a job afterwards, as far as, especially if it's, you know, a branding type job and they're trying to steal the accolades of the seals underneath them. Um, if you don't start calling those guys out, weeding them out, and the guys that you know have significant problems that have gotten guys killed, and calling them out, uh, 
if you don't start making those corrections, there will not be a SEAL team in the future. That's awesome advice, Eric. Now, if you had it your way, um, how do you think that the guys that are currently out there, if there was a way to actually fix everything that's been done, whether it's your Marcus Luttrell or your Rob O'Neill or your Jockos, like how and is it possible for them to make this right? Would it be as easy as a Marcus Luttrell coming out and saying, hey, you know, all this was false. I was made to do this or a Rob O'Neill saying, hey, I didn't shoot Bin Laden. Like what would that look like for you? Oh, oh, so let me talk about Marcus. First thing, Marcus, you know, in my last podcast, you know, the truth is is going to set you free. I, you were used as a pawn. And um, and as soon as you say, you know, start explaining to everybody, this is what I was told to do. And this is why I did it. And these are the decisions I made at this point. Um, it's going to, you know, it's going to get your your soul right with yourself and you're going to be a happier person. Um, and by and that's an honorable thing. So I'm okay with that. When it comes to Rob O'Neill and, you know, and Matt Bissonette and, you know, and Red and who actually shot Osama bin Laden, I, I'm at lost. I wasn't down at Dev Group. I don't know what the truth is. But th I'll tell you what, those guys down there do know. And um, I wish that Try, so the worst thing you could do to a tri, to a uh, SEAL is pull his trident, especially an active duty SEAL. I think there should be more tridents pulled. And then and as soon as they're pulled, it should be basically you're on this list of tridents that were pulled so that you can't go to another agency with your SEAL credentials and say, hey, I was a Navy SEAL down at Dev Group. You know, take me on as, you know, a contractor. And they don't know the history. They don't know that this guy's, you know, you know, you know, a football bat. <laughs> so the same thing needs to happen to the guys that are out in public that are not living up to the SEAL ethos or the SEAL code. And, you know, put me under that spotlight, you know, say, oh, hey, Eric, you're out in the media. We don't like what you're saying. Uh, we're going to have a board and we're going to decide if we're going to pull your trident. And, you know, as far as, and it's, I'm going to go up on that fucking, that board. <laughs> that type of scrutiny needs to go to everybody that is out in the media. And if we can't do that to our, our own, how, and we can't clean our own house, whether they're still in or if they're out, we can't do this. Then if we can't clean our own house, how can you guys ever trust us? I mean, after the Melgar situation, and, you know, how sickening is that? As far as fucking two seals, you know, kill a green beret, and then they try to hit on the wife, and, and that whole story, you know, that's another book and um, you know story that needs to be well told and well you know explained because that's an, and it's mentioned in Code Over Country, uh, but it's just sick what those guys did, and if you look at the guys, those guys that did it, and if you look at the direct you know, you know leadership. You'll find out that probably Tim Samansky had, you know, some to do with, you know, promoting those guys, or at least, you know, the other guys that he promoted underneath him have something to do with it. If we don't clean house like that, you know, there's not a lot of hope for the SEAL teams. Yeah, because I know within SF, like you do anything crazy, the command just pulls your tab, right? Because uh, it's one way of keeping everybody in line. If you know that you risk losing your actual tab, if you get out of line, then more than likely, you're not going to act up, right? And since they started doing that, everybody within the regiment, for the most part, has gotten their shit together. And again, Eric, I appreciate you coming on and uh, and actually taking this fight on. Now, before we conclude this, uh, is there anything you want to talk about, Eric? Is there anything you want to discuss? No, you, when you you brought up your you know the younger generation wanting to come in and um, and uh, and I mentored a lot of guys that were basically trying to go to seals and and. And I didn't, I was getting, a, we were getting a lot of questions as far as um, about steroids. And uh, because it was an open, you know, it was just me and, you know, some younger guys, actually me and a couple other SEALs and some younger guys. And they're like, what's your stance on, on steroids? And I was just like, well, first thing, I didn't need it to get through buds. And uh, I said, did I suspect some of the guys there might be on it? I said, and I was a class leader. So I had, you know, a good, 
situational awareness. I said, maybe. I said, I think there might have been some. I said, but it didn't help them perform better. And I said, it, it actually, their aggression, they didn't make the, the proper shoot, non-shoot decision sometimes. They didn't handle their aggression right. And I said, that's just one aspect of, of the steroid situation. The other one is that it's if you have to use those to get through something, then it's a mental crutch that you basically, you need something else to succeed. So it makes you mentally weak. And it basically, you never really get a chance to challenge yourself. So if anybody's pushing you to do these type things, it doesn't help you. It makes you a oh, uh, not as good of an operator. It makes you make bad decisions under stress and under pressure. You don't make good decisions. And anybody that knows that you did it, especially as if you're an officer or you become a senior enlisted down the line and they know you did these, you've done these things, they got leverage over you and they can make you know, so you can't hold them accountable when you, when you should. And so that type of guys that are promoting that type of stuff are the exact guys that you need to stay away from. And that, that will basically maybe set you up for success of being a good operator. I agree. I agree hundred percent. And as somebody that's, that's, that's done it, I can uh, confirm everything that Eric is saying, right? And I feel like I have to get on here and make sure that I say that I did it just to get ahead of the comments or as people are going to start calling me hypocrites. I didn't. Yeah. I appreciate you being honest and saying it because oh, that's, course. you know, more of people course. like that. It, and, you know, so, and it's, that really helps. And that'll help and, these kids that, that, that I can tell that you care about. And that's why I'm on your podcast. Right. But again, Eric, man, I appreciate you coming on and sharing this. Uh, guys, if you have any questions for Eric, leave it in the comment section below. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Hey, Jay, before we sign off, I just want to read some parts of emails I received from SEALs reaching out to me who share firsthand accounts of their experience in Ramadi with Jocko and Chris Kyle. Number one, Jocko didn't have a clear mission during most operations, but would just send his guys out anyway. Jocko's guys would go up in pairs on rooftops of houses in Ramadi and just start shooting at people. Chris Kyle would go up on security gate rooftop at Shark Base in Ramadi, right there on the Euphrates River, and shoot people walking down the street, shoot kids riding their bikes, and shoot families walking together. It is a known fact that Chris Kyle was murdering innocent people on the streets of Iraq under Jocko's direct supervision. The SEAL ASO group, that at times would have to go out and pay money to these families for these unjustified shootings and killings. Number two, SEALs would go to investigate these so-called justified shootings of cars that were supposed to be heading towards the base, but upon inspection, they'd find that the bullet trajectory clearly showed that the vehicles were shot from the back, which shows that they were going away from the base. Number three, a lot of abuse and murder perpetuated by Jocko and Chris Kyle bled over and corrupted the culture of the teams operating there. The task unit commander who replaced Jocko eventually put a stop to what was going on. I thought these, I thought it was important to share these with you because they're not just my words, but words of SEALs who were actually there and served with Jocko and Chris Kyle. Thanks. Hey, Jay, that patch you're about to show uh, is a picture of a patch that Jocko allowed some of his guys to wear. And it kind of shows uh, the mindset that he and the culture that he allowed and fostered while he was in country in Iraq.